So I go in the dorm to collect my slaves. There is a little line in front of me. They start calling me, showing me their IDs and everything. And here comes this guy that I have a great report to. I could notice by his body language that something wasn't right. He turned around, took this fighting stance, and started coming at me. And uh, continue on to the prison, and then uh, what advice, if we're just keep coming here, what advice uh, as you get closer, if you're still in it? Okay, great. Okay. Can you hold down some speed, I'm with 125, with the active jetpack, I'm still front position. We are the ones doing office hours for the inmates. Um, which means every time they have a little issue regarding their money or there is something going on with their phones or they need to go see anyone from management, they have to come to us and we help them as much as we can. I'm actually, our, our main priority is classification. We are the ones in charge of classifying inmates throughout the whole state, um, CPOs, you know, throughout the whole, um, the three levels of security. Uh, minimum pre-release and medium and maximum. So that's pretty much um, what we do. I've heard it argued that you guys are sort of the the forgotten division of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Definitely, although um, you know by now they have mentioned, oh, you know, they forget about correction officers, whatever. But if you talk about correction officers, everybody knows what a correction officer is. Not everybody knows what a correctional program officer is. or the so-called caseworkers. So I can tell you that um, we do pretty much um, the same job they do. There are actually two facilities run in the state by CPOs. Um, we take inmates to work, we do pads, uh, pad, ser uh, pad searches, strip searches, we do urine analysis just like the COs do. Um, the thing is that when you go behind the walls then you become in a, in a caseworker. When you go to a medium or a maximum security facility, you become a caseworker and your duties are more directed um, or driven for classification in what I already told you. So another thing, like for example, in my particular case, my office is located at the very far end of the tier. Um, alone there, or actually I will be alone in a couple of weeks because my psychic is retiring after 30 something years. And I have probably between, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 inmates between me and the officers. So if something like ever happens in my office, you know, it's, they, they'll get there, but it's gonna take them some time because there are tons of inmates in the middle. Um, we face the same issues that CEOs face. Um, we, we, we also deal with some type of uh, PTSD, if you wanna call it like that, especially because we have a more um, open um, access to documents and stuff. We read FBI documents, uh, we interpret, uh, uh, parole board decisions, um, we read that also too. Um, and you get to read the OVs or official versions and they definitely take a toll on you. Um, you get to really know what the inmates are in for. Um, CEOs usually don't get to find out. We do because we are the case workers and it's very difficult and challenging at times for you to treat another human being um, at a professional level when you know what he's serving time for. So if you happen to see, uh, I don't know, like something that comes to my mind now, uh, where I work, I wanna say at least 50% of the population where I work are all sex offenders. So these people, um, they are pedophiles and you know, they're attracted to little kids and uh, teenage kids, boys and girls, and they will do nasty things to, you know, to, to children and you go and you read the OV and then this guy comes to you and asks you to do something, you have to be able to put that to the side and remain professional and do what you gotta do because at the end of the day, you know, the inmate was already sentenced, he's already punished by serving his time, um, but even like that, it's, sometimes it's really hard to make sure you do your job the right way and you still have to do it because that's what you get paid to do. How do you do it? How do you mentally shut off that that knowledge and just go about things as if they were, you know, just an individual? I guess you kind of get used to it somehow. I can personally say I have always been pretty good at keeping myself 
out of the prison after I joined the agency. I want to say probably three or four years after I did that. I remember um, sometimes it, it's, it's difficult. It, it takes some time for you to realize that this is the job you do. This is not who you are. So at the end of the day, some people have an issue leaving their issues outside and bring them in um, with the inmates. And you might find somebody that had an issue with their husband or you know, their wife, whatever, and they had a rough night and they come in to work here and all of a sudden he's arguing with an inmate and the inmate will look at him and say, oh, you know, what? what's going on here? Because they are not able to leave their personal life out of the field. That happens. Um, it's very common. Um, I want to say after you've been in probably between five, six years in, you kind of get a grip on what you are really doing. For me, I joined the agency and I didn't even know how it happened. I wasn't looking for this, um, but I've been around for almost a decade and I enjoy it. Um, I'm not going to say I don't like it because if I say that, I'm going to be lying. I don't have a passion for the job, but I enjoy it. I, I do what I do. It has great benefits. You got job security. And the best part out of all this is that you get to work with real good people. We all have each other's back. We know it doesn't matter the color of the uniform. We should be working as a team, and we do. So if there's a rec officer in trouble, if there is a CPO in trouble, if there is a CO in trouble, um, and, and you see what's going on, and this officer is getting you know, uh, beaten by an email or something, you just cannot just walk away. You know, like, come on, man. Your fellow officer is in trouble. Like, you should jump in. You should, you should help out. So we might look different when it comes to the uniform and stuff like that. Our unions are different too, but we are definitely a big family. Any message that you hope that people take home from watching these? I just wish that people uh, was a, were a little more understanding of the type of job that we do. Whether people tell you um, that they don't change or they do, I want to tell you uh, personally, this job will change you. You will not be the same person 10 years after you join the agency. You won't even be the same person within a year in, because there will be some things that back in the day you wouldn't pay attention to, and, and now you do. Like, you, you got kids. You don't pretty much trust anybody. Like, legit, reading all those OVs and seeing how these guys, what they can do to people. We are put away in the middle of nowhere as officers dealing with what nobody else wants to deal with. They grab all the wars of society, they put them in prison, and then it's our job to make sure they stay there, they serve their sentence, um, they get some programming, they follow the rules, we hold them accountable. Um, so I really, I, I think people need to keep in mind the fact that this is just not an easy job. Right. It's not for everybody. Sometimes people will come to the job for the money they pay you, but then when they are six months in, a year in, they realize this is just not for me, and they quit. It takes a special um, individual to do this type of job. Awesome. Anything you want to add that I might have missed? Um, no, not really. Just I, I enjoy working here. I, as I already mentioned that, CEOs are great. We get along very well. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we only have each other's back. Classification is what drives the whole department, depending on how you, uh, how inmates are um, housed, and we make sure we do that uh, properly, following procedure and doing the right thing. Are there any, I mean, I'm sure you've had many experiences over the years here. Are there any in particular that stand out in your mind? Well, there was something that happened, um, I want to say probably five years ago or so, um, at the place where I used to work, um, CPOs had to go in and collect phone slips. Um, within the procedure of collecting the phone slips, you have to make sure you check the inmate um, by the inmate's ID. So they will hand you a phone slip and they will also hand you uh, the inmate ID so you can you know, double check and make that this guy is not trying to play games on another inmate, you know, stuff like that. So what was a little, um, I don't want to say surprising, but you kind of don't see that happening. Um, usually if you have a good report with an inmate, the inmate has a little more respect for you. And I actually had a pretty good report with this guy. So who knows what was going through his mind. And 
he probably was having a bad day. Um, obviously, you don't, you just don't know. You just go in as you do every day. And I happened to go in a dorm where there were at least 80 or 70, 80 inmates. So I go in the dorm to collect my sleeves. There is a little line in front of me. They start coming, showing me their IDs and everything. And here comes this guy that I have a great report to. I could notice by his body language that something wasn't right. But still, you know, rules are the rules. They should be following the rules. So he handed me a phone slip. I took it from him and he just walked away. And I called him and I said, hey, I need to check your ID. He said, oh, you already know me. And I said, no, I still have to check it. So just show me your ID. He didn't take that very well. He turned around, took this fighting stance and started coming at me. I'm just reminding you there were uh, 70, 80 inmates there. So I think one of the qualities that any person working for, for, correction, uh, for corrections needs to build is uh, try to look confident even when you are not. And the minute I look at this guy and I realize what was about to happen, I was like, this is not, this is just not good. And he kept on walking and I kept on saying to the guy, hey man, relax, it's, it's really not a big deal, I just gotta check your ID. So the email wasn't, he wasn't buying what I was telling him. And I looked at him and I said, you know what, man, we're not gonna have an issue over this. And I just walked out. So obviously the inmate wasn't too happy about it. He just um, started using profanity like crazy. Um, within what, maybe two minutes or so, I reported it. They took him to segregation and that, that was pretty much the end of the issue until he got out of segregation and went down to my office. And believe it or not, he apologized. So <clears throat> stuff like that happens too. But you know, it's sort of that, that fear that not knowing what's going to happen, yeah, you how that situation is going to play out. I mean, that could have played out a million different ways. Yes, absolutely. You just never know. You go there one day, you hope and pray that you come out on your own, and and you make sure you try to keep yourself as safe as you as you can. You know, always relying on other people, and sometimes just relying on yourself. You you got to do what you got to do to remain alive. You got family, you got people on the outside waiting for you, um, you got hobbies, you, you do other stuff. This is why I said before, corrections is not who you are, it's what you do for a living. Don't, don't let corrections um, change who you are when it comes to just thinking and breathing and, and talking and sharing what you do. I personally try to not talk about work after I'm out. So I go out, I do what I gotta do. People usually ask, hey, how's work doing? I just say, it, it's okay. Some people know, some people don't. I usually don't share what I do for work. So, but at the end of the day, you just gotta make it work for you and for your family.